Hi, my name is Florine, and I'm a developer. And I'm Adrian, and I'm a designer. And today we're going to talk about internet connected fridges. What? Well, seriously, internet connected fridges? Yeah, that, that's the topic for today. Oh, well, maybe we should change the, the title to uh, Internet Connected Fridges and Why You Don't Have One. Speaking of which, you just took this drink out of the fridge. What, what are we having? I have no idea what that is. It's red and it's, sweet. It's from Hamburg, Germany. It's called Fritz Limo. Apfel, Kirsch, Holunder, Limonade. Sounds very German. Let's try it. Sounds awfully German. Cheers. Sweet and tangy. Quite good. Good vintage. Very German. Yeah. <laughs> so, the internet connected fridge. Um, I don't have one. Do you? Me neither. Do any of your friends, family, relatives have one? I don't think so, no. Yours? I don't think so. Well, th that's the thing about uh, internet connected things. Not many people own like, I'm not... IoT devices. I'm not sure about that. I think, well, it's a growing market. It's, it's, uh, we, I it's agree expanding. With you, yeah. um, and I think there are some really good examples out there. Um, I, know, I know some people who own a U lamp, Philips U lamp. That's an internet connected device. It is, and that's actually a pretty cool one. I really like that. I, I have no idea uh, how good the app is or how good the interface is. I don't, I don't know, but I do like the idea that you can change the color of your lights. And it, ha it has something that um, has the potential to be enormously kitschy, but it's also kind of cool. Yeah, but the problem is that it's, it's just, you know, I have this app and it's for the Philips U and probably I can control multiple Philips U lamps with it, but it stops there. If I have a Nest, Nest thermostat, I need to have another app for that. And yeah, I, uh, well, there are, there are some, some devices who do that on, sort of on their own. I know that Tesla can do like firmware updates uh, as it connects to your Wi-Fi, which is cool. That's quite, so, so you consider the Tesla an Internet of Things device? It's, it's connected to the internet in that sense that it can download like its own firmware update and it can basically, you know, fix itself, which is... Oh, that's, that's pretty awesome. It's pretty cool. You can just put it in your garage and it'll, it'll do that on its own. And you don't have to go to like your dealership and get the, the uh, onboard computer updated. So that's, that's nice. Yeah, but I don't, I, I think the Tesla is more of in the category of my mobile phone. I can update my mobile, mobile phone over the air as well. And... I don't consider my mobile phone or my smartphone to be a Internet of Things device, or do you? Um, not really. Well, it, you know, it is a glorified... Uh, Computer? No, no, it's a glorified camera with, uh, with some Wi-Fi capability, basically. Because you can put everything on Facebook and Instagram. Yep. But I, I think there are, the, the Internet of Things has kind of a bad rap. Uh, because, well, it's, it's something that's, you know, made fun of a lot, I think. Uh, but seriously, um, do, you, do you know about the site we put a chip in it dot tumblr dot com? It's I hilarious. I have heard of it. I mean, why do we need a water bottle that can connect to your app and to, to an app or socks? Well, the, the water bottle is interesting because like there are there are a few who do that. Like Vessel is one that I know. OK, what and does it do? It's a smart device that analyzes the contents and it sort of warns you uh, how many calories you're drinking and uh, how much caffeine and how much sugar intake. So there is some like functionality to that, but I, I don't really see the benefit of that over like a traditional label on a bottle. Yes, or and are they going to send this data to my health insurance? So if they see I only drink, uh, you know, sugared waters, they will vodka. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, they will up my uh... your insurance premium. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you, I, I don't I mean, know where the data goes. Also, um, yeah, that's a big problem. It is a big problem, but it's a, it's. I mean, that's the, essentially the same problem as as you have with with, for instance, Nest, which I think is a great product, but I'm never going to touch that with a ten foot pole because I don't know where my data goes. 
and I guess this is this is a thing that uh, that bothers me a lot. I think I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think a lot of you think about this, but what 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 happens to your data, and um, what happens if your data is being sold, and what happens? Well, what happens when your company, when the company who has your data is being sold? That's the interesting part. Uh, like exactly. Acquire hires or you know this. Yeah. That's going to be that's going to be a problem in the future, and so for me that there is I have a lot of that whenever I see an internet connected device um, I think okay but where's this data go and how do I use it because uh, I think where the Internet of Things currently is missing out is the connectedness about it because every thing has their own app. Uh, yeah, so they're like, you know, small walled gardens and they have like, yeah, you with this app you can control this, but you cannot like you can't also you can't control your lights and your stereo. temperature or your stereo or whatever at the same exactly. time. So it's like there is no relation between and these apps also don't communicate in any way. No, and that, and, and because they're all all use proprietary um, protocols to talk to their uh, to their to their servers. Yeah. And um, and I think this is this is quite bothersome because I think the in, having connected devices like uh, that create a network uh, that help can help me as a user uh, to accomplish make tasks easier, um, even if they're just menial tasks like turning on the lights or uh, setting up my stereo or things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's really cool that we can do that but as long as there are separate channels I think yeah I think why bother and when you look at the commercial available solutions for anything internet connected um, maybe the Amazon dash button or the nest or you know well, if the, you're the, into internet connected socks for me for me the, the Amazon or the, the Amazon dash button is like a, a whole different category for me is that is like a throwaway internet of things thing it's like it has one function, it does nothing else, and as soon as the battery runs out, you throw it away. That's kind of sad, and it, especially in, in, in these times where we should also look at renewability and uh, sustainability. Yeah, exactly. But, but okay, let's, let's not let's look at the, yeah. the environmental impact of that. Um, still, I think we have all these different separate channels, and they will not, they're not a network, they're not connected, and they're, they all require their separate apps, and these apps don't talk to each other, and of course, Apple is doing some things like HomeKit, where you are going to connect these things, and I think... Yeah, but th this, this, for me, leads to, to a whole other uh, host of problems, because I have concerns when it comes to what does Nest know about me? What does Nest know about my habits? What does Nest know when I'm home, when I'm not home? And of course, I mean, if you can hack a nest, you will know when someone's home or not. Like if Absolutely. You were, if you're, you know, going to serial burglar a string of houses that are all nest connected, you can find out a lot of information about uh, when is a good time to access this home and how long would you have. And that is one part of the problem. But the same goes for instance, uh, for Philips Hue, you can also learn about a person's habits. When does he go to sleep? When does he get up? When does he go to work? By just knowing when lights go on and off. And I that's think quite bothersome. That is bothersome, and and the more of this information you collect in one place, the, the more the scarier, scarier it gets. For me, yeah. I, I I know some people have have no concerns about this, and I know that ideally, uh, you know, you would want your thermostat, your central air if you have that, um, your stereo, your lights, uh, your locks, um, your doorbell. You want everything talking to each other to make the Best experience for you. Exactly. As a user. Uh, basically, it it makes uh, it should make you want to just never have to leave your couch. <laughs> Ooh. Well. Well, that is sort of what all these well, things well, of are aiming for. We, we, we got apps like Runkeeper and Strava to uh, to get to, to do sports. Is that true? Because I, I I mean I thought Runkeepers was like something you install on your phone and you just show the girls to like yeah 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 I run I run really once every seven months. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but so, that also tells. I mean, uh, if if you if you look at uh, uh, fitness trackers, for instance, okay. which is also sort of an, uh, it's an Internet of Thing by proxy because it connects to your phone, which is then connected to the internet. Okay, um, that also can tell an immense amount of personal data about you and your habits, it, your health. Uh, 
basically about who you are as a person. And like you said, if, if that goes uh, uh, no further than the person who made your device, that's fine. Um, but we don't know that. We have no guarantee of that. And when it does go as far as it'll go to your, uh, your healthcare provider, that's a serious problem. Yeah. And what's going to happen then? What are they going to do with their data? Speaking of which, there uh, was a website, I don't recall the name, uh, I'll put a link in the description, uh, that uh, invented devices that would trick Fitbits. Okay. So you could uh, sort of fake your steps for oh, a day. Oh my God. Because yeah, they would, some companies would dis distribute these to their employees, but then use the data and give that to their healthcare provider. Ooh, that's that's so. I, yeah, that for me that's that's very very tricky. Yeah, that's. But you know, there are people who are like, ah, I can I can make a machine that you know is basically a stepper motor that will fake out <laughs> the, the Fitbits. It's uh, a cool project. It is an awesome project. Speaking really of like speaking of which, we we we, we talked about commercial uh, Internet of Things devices or um, apps. Um, I think. Uh, the cool thing about the Internet of Things is that it's quite easy to build your own. Um, you have some experience in this area. I, think. I have. Um, well, it's, it's more of a, of a hobby of mine. And there is the Arduino platform, platform and it's really easy to get started and you connect, uh, can connect all kinds of things to it. Although the, while the Arduino platform is really nice to make embedded devices, you know, things that do stuff with input and output and you can program them and it's way easier than building your own logic with a, on a circuit board. I have done that in the past and it's, it's really hard. <laughs> so is programming... That like, is that a soldering problem? No, 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 no. That's making your circuit board and put the components in and, you know, it's way easier to type an if statement in the Arduino interface. So, but the, there's a problem with the Arduino interface. It's... It doesn't connect to Wi-Fi, 3G, out of the box. So there is this um, this chip, and I've got one here. It's 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 really really small. Um, I could accidentally drop it in the bottle here, but Don't. let's let's not do that. This is an ESP8266, um, and it costs only about if I buy one, they're about six seven euros, including shipping from Hong Kong, and this chip. It can, you can put a program on it and it connects to Wi-Fi out of the box. So um, I'm currently doing a project with, it's going to be just a button that whenever you press it, it call, calls a pre-configured URL. And you might say that's quite useless, but I think I can think some cool stuff that we can do with that. Um, any web you don't need a reason for web anything. Hooks, anything. No, and I, I'm sure once I have it running, we'll do a whole episode on it and Definitely. it's going to be epic. So, but this chip is tiny. You can run it from a, a battery or from a um, from a. Can you use like a button battery? You could use a button battery. Um, it can. You can put it in deep sleep, so you uh, it will only trigger when you press a button or on a timer, for instance. So it will okay. only wake up every ten seconds or every thirty seconds to send some data. You could put a temperature sensor sensor on this and then wait, make it wake up every minute to send the temperature to your own web server or something like that. It's it's really simple to set up and it's okay, cool. quite awesome. I've also got this is. It's a kind of a fun thing. This is a micro view. It was a Kickstarter campaign, I think, last year or two years ago. Yeah, um, they were after they were required by SparkFun, so they're still manufactured by SparkFun. It's a bit more expensive. This is an Arduino compatible chip, and it contains an OLED display, so you can yeah. do all kinds of uh, display stuff. So I made a little program, and I want to show you what it does. So let's yeah. have a let, let's have a look. Um, it's it's a couple of lines of code, and when I plug it into a USB, it will uh, it will power from USB. So let's see what it does. Let's do that. Cool, eh? Yeah, that's pretty nice. Well, <laughs> it's quite kind of pointless, but it's totally pointless. Uh, but it is awesome that you you these kind of components are available, and I'm I'm wondering what we could do with this in, from a design point of view. Like not in a design point of view how it looks, but in a design point of view from uh, like how, how is it going to interact with it. 
our users? I think, or? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And also, how is it going to... Um, how are we going to? What is what is the going is the impact from the, of this going to be on uh, on us as web developers and web designers? Uh, and I think one interesting bit um, that uh, it's a Google project. Um, uh, it's not a Google product. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it, they they are actively uh, participating in this project, and it's called the physical web. We talked about these commercial vendors, and they all have problems with okay, we have a thing, and we have an app. Yeah. What this project is, is, um, you know, I'm not going to install an app just to buy something with my credit card from uh, vending machines. They, they, they actually did some calculation. And if you wanted to use an, uh, to buy something with an app from a vending machine in the US, you'd have to install several thousand apps to be compatible with all of them. Oh my God. So that's, and I'm not going to, when I'm standing in front of a vending machine and I'm on a roaming and I'm not going to, or I have a crappy 3G connection, I'm not going to install an app. So the physical web, what they're doing is they made something on top of Bluetooth, because Bluetooth is like a broad, they also have broadcasting patterns, so you can mm -hmm. see, uh, see another way you yep. see that when you do pairing. And what they did, they had, there is a, a field in the, in the package they send out where they put in a URL. So okay. when you have a physical web enabled phone, it's, they currently do it in an app, and you're near, uh, near, near a vending machine, for instance, it will say, hey, here is my URL, go to this. And then it will pop up in the app and you can click on it and say, okay, it's a vending machine. And you will have instant access to the website of that vending machine that's maybe running on the vending machine or maybe it's kind of also on an external server. But that is just a technical bit. It's, mm -hmm. It makes connecting from your phone to the device really easy. You don't have to type mm -hmm. in URLs, you don't have to install apps. And of course, we still have to, they still have to tackle things like payment. How are you going to do that? Because entering credit card details every time. Well, they're, they are working on that. I mean, uh, look at, you know, Google Wallet, Google Pay. I don't know, they, cha they changed the name a dozen times. Uh, and same with Apple Pay or Apple Wallet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I can't They switched that. that. I don't no. know why. Uh, I think Google switched from uh, Google Pay to Google Wallet and Apple went from Apple Pay to Apple Wallet or the other way around. It was really weird. It's confusing for, yeah, for, either the, way. End, for the end user. But still, um, the real power comes when we as uh, web people can work on internet connected devices and mm -hmm. providing services to people using internet connected devices. And this goes into the connectedness of the internet of things. Because currently we have I've said this probably five times by now. We have an app and a thing, and they communicate, and then you have another app and another thing, and they communicate, and et cetera, yeah. et cetera, instead of having, you know, a, like a mesh network of different devices talking to each other, being controlled by several phones, by computers, by a website, et cetera. No, no that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, I think that would also be like a, a, an approach that would enable me to uh, see the, the controlling device, if that's a phone, you know, then it's, it's not a single purpose device either way. But um, I'm, I'm very worried about uh, one, where does the data go and who collects this? And that how will, does it, that how will, it aggregate it? That will always be a problem. That's not something that will probably be solved uh, quite easily. Of course, there are some movements about Distributed, distribu distributed data and um, owning your own data. And there are even services that can do that, that they... That, that is true, but who are the large players in this at this very moment? Absolutely. Namely Google. Is Google going to give you your data? I'm not guessing no. It's Probably their, not. It's because in their, in their, or Facebook, are they going to give you your data? I don't think so. No, because it's their business model to do something with that data. Exactly, that's how they make their money. So it's not in their interest to to uh, to free your data in that sense. And the same goes with Amazon. I mean, they will send you, they will ship you products under the the uh, cost, and then monetize your data, Absolutely. which is fine yeah. if that's you know an upfront deal that you're making. But often that's not very clear. And of course, what is going to happen? Of course, you have an agreement about your data with your provider or the, the, the service you're using right now. But what's going to happen in 10 years' time when A, you're mm -hmm. not using the service anymore, and B, 
the service gets abandoned or sold off. What's, and especially what's, the latter part that worries me. If it's abandoned... Well, if it's, if it's abandoned and it's going to be, you know, I see what I see happening is there's going to be a laptop lying on the curb and then somebody... Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or someone has, a, has, has like an old server standing somewhere and he thinks, you know what, I'm just going to put this to the curb and then... Uh, yeah, exactly. And then someone picks it up and takes it home. Uh, we've had incidents in the Netherlands where they, they uh, I think the police or the Ministry of Justice or something, they put out laptops, old laptops... <laughs> Uh, on the street and people took them home Ouch. and there were un yeah, unencrypted was... files on it. It's a few years ago, but still, I mean, you don't know what happens with your data. Oh, and, that's, uh, and that's something to think about, I think. That is something to think about. And I think we need to, to change uh, the way we look at uh, the Internet of Things. I mean, I, I, don't think, I don't see why we need another w smart water bottle to tell me that I need a sip of water. I mean, we've survived for many thousands of years without this feature. I think we can survive now. I don't need to, a plastic device that needs a battery charge every six hours to tell me, hey, by the way, have a sip of water. Okay, I mean, maybe that case, you're right. But I think there are a lot of other applications which can be really useful, which can be helpful, which can make my life better, easier, more comfortable. Okay, let's, uh, I'd say, uh, let's revisit this in uh, like a couple of months, maybe a year, and see I where think, we are then. I think that's it is a good up and coming. Idea. I think that's a good idea. Thanks for listening. Uh, Please comment, subscribe, uh, write us what you thought of the episode, uh, write us uh, ideas for topics. Uh, we're always interested in you know. new, fresh ideas. Exactly. And I'd like to thank DigitPaint for letting us use the rooms to record this episode. And of course, the lovely Lika Asfeld from Asfeld Photo for recording this session for us. Thank you.